the good news is I can stick to five minutes because everything that Patty just said, I completely endorse. And I met Patty five years ago at a Financial Times conference where I was working in SNAP as a CEO, worrying about the storage and the molecules. And he was advocating for uh, an electrification of, of a lot of consumption. And we were thoroughly disagreeing. And the great news is that hydrogen really brought us together as friends and now also uh, soon as, as colleagues. So uh, let me explain a little more what I, mean, what I just said. I started my energy career in NL. For those who don't know, NL is one of the world's largest developers of renewable energy and, and a big utility in Italy. And when I was in NL in 2014, I was sent to the Global Hydrogen Conference in Kyoto. I came back fully in love with hydrogen, but there is a slight problem, as Patty just showed us. The cost was $1,000 per megawatt hour, and the value of oil at the time was around $10 a megawatt hour. So it was costing 100 times more than oil. I then, from NL, moved to ENI. ENI is the biggest oil and gas company in Africa. I worked in Libya, in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Congo, in Angola, in Nigeria, and ENI is one of the world's biggest natural gas companies doing LNG exploration and all that work. And I was just stuck with this idea that you can't electrify everything, that you need storage, that you need molecules, that you need to worry about the heavy industries that cannot be run on batteries and cables. And I was really frustrated about the fact that hydrogen was a perfect solution. It was just too expensive. And I didn't do my homework. I kind of let, I was stuck with this idea of just super expensive. Then, in 2016, I moved to SNAM. SNAM is Europe's largest uh, gas company. We have pipelines, we have uh, liquefac uh, regasification, gas storage, and we completed last year a pipeline to bring natural gas from Azerbaijan across the Caspian Sea, across Azerbaijan, across uh, Georgia, across all of Turkey, across Albania, across Greece, into uh, $50 billion project with, with BP. So you have to go and get gas from really, really far, I think. And as we were worrying about uh, how to decarbonize our entire system, on the one hand, building these massive projects, on the other hand, uh, really working to decarbonize fast, uh, my, my strategy team came, came into the office saying, we see a path to make hydrogen at $1 a kilo or $25 a megawatt hour. This, these are exactly the numbers that Patty was showing. And we see a path that if we scale up enough electrolyzer capacity while the cost of solar and wind continues to fall, we can get to a system where from the historical 1,000 we bring it all the way down to 25. That was an eureka moment. I, I knew in that meeting that lasted for a couple of hours that my life was going to be dedicated to pursuing this, to accelerating this, and to delivering this $1 a kilo, $25 a megawatt hour number. Why is that number so special? Because at that number, it becomes the cheapest form of energy full stop. Cheaper than coal, cheaper than oil, cheaper than gas. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so if we extrapolate and look forward, the market is huge. Uh, people didn't believe in this. I wrote two books, by the way. One is actually called The Hydrogen Revolution, which is for uh, adults. And, 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 and I also wrote with my two daughters a kid's book on hydrogen called Zero, Z-H-E-R-O, which by the way is also... <laughs> this is also the name of the company I have started with Patty and with Alessandra, who is here. And the reason I wrote a book for children is that this message, we have to bring it to the generation of the people who are really scared about the climate for the right reasons. Europe is on fire. We had fires in Portugal, in Spain, in France, in Italy, and in Greece, real fires destroying forests that haven't been touched for hundreds of years. So the race is on, we need uh, solutions, we have the solutions, and, and what we will do with Zero and with Patty and with Alessandra, who is working with me in SNAP, is work on world-scale iconic projects. So the first project we're doing that I want to use the remaining three minutes on is uh, to talk about tests. TESS is a company I'm now the CEO of. This is my uh, job. We're building a big hydrogen receiving terminal in Germany. This terminal alone will require 7 million tons of green hydrogen. This will require 280 
120 gigawatts of electrolyzers. The bottleneck is not the lack of demand. We already have some of the European largest com companies that are asking for the green molecules as quickly as possible. And what happened, whilst hydrogen is on this journey from 1,000 all the way down to 25, and hopefully we'll get to 25 by 2035, kind of in the next 10, 15 years, <laughs> gas has gone up and oil has gone up from 10, 7, now to 200, actually 250 today. So that's, that's the opportunity, and that's why the companies are racing to buy our solution. Our solution is to deliver synthetic methane. So we will use CO2 as a very neat way of delivering hydrogen from Namibia and other places to Germany. So we have the market. The fact that we have the companies that have already signed up means the projects that we look at from an upstream perspective become immediately bankable because we have the offtakes already in place. We have the receiving infrastructure that's being permitted and fast-tracked. So all we need to do is to find the land, put the panels, put the electrolyzers, convert that from hydrogen to CH4, and then we're off to the races. And as we look at the map of the world of where the most attractive uh, solar and wind resources are, Namibia is very high up. I don't want to repeat what Patty said, but the availability of land the predictable and, and the political stability, the ambition that we're experiencing in these two days of really a lot of entrepreneurial drive and, and, and government ambition to make this happen. It just couldn't be better, the access to the land and the access to the sea, to the deep sea ports. So really, uh, Namibia can, can be a hub, a regional hub for Africa for, for this hydrogen revolution. And when you become a hub, magical things happen. It's not just about exporting the sun. And it's not about exporting the Libyan wind to Germany. It's about creating jobs and an ecosystem where as you scale up the renewables, you become the place with the cheapest energy. And as you become a place with cheap energy, with availability of land, with availability of natural resources, with availability of lithium and silicium and other rare uh, earth in or around Namibia, then you really attract the next industrial revolution. And if I'm Amazon, and I require huge amounts of green energy for my data centers. Because people now when they watch Netflix, they want to run off a data center that's green. And which better place in Namibia were to build regional data centers? <laughs> which, which better place in Namibia to make green steel? The iron ore is here, the ports are here, and the cheap energy is going to be here. So we call it the hydrogen revolution, but this is really an industrial and a social revolution. Because we need to start from the schools, we need to start with a positive message that kids can understand there is a chance to save the planet from global warming, and there is a chance to combine economic and social prosperity at the same time. And we start from the schools, we bring it to the universities, we attract global technology into Namibia, and we can get the manufacturing, we can get the exports, and we can also attract other companies that are looking for cheap energy where to base their operations. Thank you very much.